It's such a blessing and such an honor to be with you all today and to be a part of this great cloud of witnesses who stand together, as Pastor Joe mentioned, recognizing the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who close to nearly 2,000 years ago died and rose on the third day. Today I pray that we're able to look at the Scriptures and see what the Scriptures say about that resurrection. What the biblical evidence and the science of the Word of God says about the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus. Not just a spiritual resurrection, but a physical, bodily resurrection. It's very important that we understand the difference. That when somebody gives their life to Jesus, that is a spiritual decision. That is a spiritual resurrection for the sinner, for the unbeliever, to put their trust in Jesus. But the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ means something altogether different. And I pray that after today, we would have a better handle and understanding as to what that means for us in our faith, in our everyday life, in our careers, in our marriages, in our relationships, so that God can bring the transformation that he wants to bring in this world. How many of you know that we live in a dark world? We live in a world where people are still suffering from loneliness throughout the pandemic. We are living in a day and age where people are weary of physical contact. We're living in a day and age where folks are still afraid to come out of their houses. We're living in a day and age where we don't even know what normal means anymore. We're living in a day and age where people are contemplating suicide or wanting to live another day, having to make the decision on whether or not life is worth living after a loved one passes away, as was the case in my neighborhood on the 700th block of West Columbia Street in Long Beach early Good Friday morning when a spouse passed away and his wife could not think of living another day without him, and she breathed her last on that Good Friday morning. I came home to four blocks, cordoned off by the Long Beach PD, not able to get to my house except for moving the orange cones and the yellow caution tape. Maybe some of you read or heard or saw what happened there in my neck of the woods. It was a tragedy, a tragedy of a life gone too soon. We live in a day and age where people question their purpose or they look for purpose in the wrong places. They look for identity in the wrong things. The world wants to push upon our children a different kind of standard when it comes to identity. But my Bible tells me the only place and the only one that can truly give us purpose, the only place and the only one that can give us and reveal to us our true identity is the Word of God and in the name of Jesus. Maybe some of us have known this and are being reminded of it today. Maybe this year was a great awakening for many of us. Maybe we have been looking for things in all the wrong places. 
Or like Eddie Murphy said on Saturday Night Live many years ago, Wookin Penub in all the wrong places. Turn with me, please, to the gospel according to Dr. Luke, the third gospel, the third account of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in chapter 24. Luke, the doctor, has a way of explaining things, though he was not the most comprehensive in his resurrection narrative account, that prize would go to St. John. Nonetheless, Luke chapter 24, I believe, is a great place for us to look today and to begin our conversation. And then as we unpack and discover the top ten reasons why I believe that the resurrection took place and that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah or the King, the Holy One of Israel, according to the Scriptures, and why this man that we call Jesus is in fact the risen Lord and God Himself. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. If you have it there in your Bible, simply say, Amen. Amen. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look? For the living among the dead, he is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified on the third day, excuse me, be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up, and he ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying there by themselves. Somebody say, by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We love you, Lord. On this fourth day of April, the year of our Lord, we come to you. And Father, we ask that you would open our minds, our hearts, and our spiritual eyes so that we could see beautiful things in your word. Father, we pray that the story of the gospel would resonate with our spirits. But Father God, that it wouldn't just be our, our spirit, Father God, that is encouraged or lifted up. But that our mind, our minds would be set ablaze. Our minds would be set on fire, Lord Jesus, with the truth of your word. Father, I come before you today and I thank you for this crowd of witnesses that is here today. 
to worship, to praise, to recognize and acknowledge who you are, your mighty name, and your resurrection. So, Father, I pray that you would direct our paths. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes. Father, I pray that you would lead us, Lord Jesus, into all the places that you would have us to go where we can find love, truth, purpose, identity, and life. And that you would keep us away from all the places that the enemy would try to bring us to that might lead us astray, that might cause us to doubt, that may bring us to the end of hope. And it's all these things in the name of Jesus that we pray and the people of God said, and the people of God said, and the people of God said, come on, people, put your hands together. Come on, Mission Ebenezer, hallelujah. A couple of years back, we were having a family gathering over in Lakewood at my mother-in-law's house where we are happening, happen to be living right now, my family and I, the five of us. So there's six of us living right there on, on Pixie, right there off of Carson and Paramount, and, um, and we're having a grand old time. Um, it's kind of refreshing to kind of get out of the norm and, and be over there with, with Mama Mo. She's such a wonderful person, and and she just loves having us around the house, even though she yells at the kids all the time and makes sure they clean up after themselves, uh, much to her chagrin. She's not um, doing a very good job of, of keeping them on their task, but we'll keep working on that with the kids. Amen? But, but a couple years ago, we were having a celebration at Mama Mo's house, and, and the whole Canales family was coming over, the Oshikoyas. And, and we were heading over there, and folks were hanging out, and and wouldn't you know, uh, Mama, Mama Pipa, which is my mom, and, and Papa, my, my father, Pastor Isaac, they were coming over to the house. And, and Papa had just gotten out of the car, and he had his, his uh, prescription sunglasses on. How many of you guys wear prescription sunglasses? How many of you guys like the real dark black tint? I like the dark black tint in my sunglasses. Well, sure enough, Papa pulled up to the house. He rapped on the door, and he walked right in and said, he's like, hey, hello. And before you know it, um, the neighbors next door said, hey, how's it going? Welcome. How can we help you? And Pops was just like, oh, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're uh, Mama Mo. And they're like, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong house. And they said, well, it's quite all right. Where are you looking? He's like, I'm looking for Modupa's house. Said, oh, she's next door. So Papa had to regroup his pride. He had to gather everything that he brought with him. He had to go down the steps of the house and make his way back over to Mama Mo's house. How many of you guys have ever gone to a place um, and it was the wrong place? How many of you ever typed in the wrong directions and your GPS took you um, on a wild goose hunt? Um, amen. How many of you guys have ever been looking in the wrong place? Sometimes we find ourselves in the wrong place. Sometimes we find ourselves in the wrong frame of mind. I've been married 18 years, and, 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 and I, I'm a, I can testify that sometimes, you know, marriage puts your mind in the wrong place. How many of you know that the things that we see and suffer in the world sometimes puts us in the wrong place? Can I hear an Amen. How many of you know that when you suffer through sickness and disease, whether it's cancer, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's depression, whether it's divorce, whether it's a broken relationship, whether it's expectations not fulfilled, sometimes our hearts, our souls, our spirit, or our mind can be in the wrong place. Can I get an amen? Sometimes we put all of our eggs in one basket, excuse the pun. And we think that maybe a career is going to satisfy our deepest longing for approval or affirmation or achievement. And then you achieve what you were setting out to do. You, you won that Super Bowl and then you thought to yourself, is that it? I remember a conversation Tom Brady had a couple of years ago after winning his fourth Super Bowl, and they thought it was just amazing. He says, it's crazy. I've won my fourth Super Bowl, and here, here now he has what? How many? How many? 
He's got seven Super Bowls, seven fingers to be measured. But he said this in that interview. I still feel like something's missing in my life. You know, sometimes we have to get from one place to another in life to realize that passing through the valley, to realize that overcoming our doubt, to realize that overcoming our unbelief was the most difficult thing for us to overcome. Look what it says here in Luke chapter 24. Verse 5. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? She was looking in the wrong place. She, her, her feet led her to look for Jesus in the wrong place. You see, the things that Jesus said about him raising from the dead after the third day had not yet set in to the disciples' minds and in their hearts. They hadn't put everything together. They had not yet put two and two together. Although Jesus had said, I'm going to leave you, but I will build this house, this temple again in three days. All throughout the Gospels, they're chock full of Jesus prophesying or foretelling his resurrection. The Old Testament scriptures all speak, point, and lead to the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, the death of the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, and the resurrection of the same. In the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the theology of suffering, why we suffer, but how we share in that experience of suffering along with Jesus, him being our example, him being our model of what it looks like to suffer, what it looks like to turn the other cheek, as Jesus taught about in the Sermon on the Mount, and as Martin Luther King lived it out, turn the other cheek. We studied what it means to suffer. We studied, and, and I, I believe many of us understand what it means that we had to go through Friday. We had to go through the, first the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, in order for us to get here today. And we are here today. Turn to your neighbor and say, I made it to today. Turn to your other neighbor, your second choice, and let them know, I made it here today. We made it to Sunday. Put your hands together, people. Put your hands together. Hallelujah. How many of you know that for the Israelites to get on the other side of the Red Sea was a task in and of itself? Yes. Fleeing from Pharaoh, fleeing from, from imminent death at any point, crossing over on dry ground across the Red Sea. But it wasn't until they were on the other side of the Red Sea that they looked back and they had perspective on everywhere that they had c come from and what God had done to get them to that point. Sometimes you got to get to the other side in order to have the perspective and for God to remind us in our spirit of why he made you and why he's allowed you to experience the things that you've ex experienced. Why God's allow you to go to the places that you've gone. Why God allows others to go through things that you don't have to go through and vice versa. Amen. Sometimes you got to be like the Israelites when, when God promised Joshua that he would be with Joshua just like he was with Moses. He didn't so much take Joshua through another Red Sea, but guess what? He did part the Jordan River and allowed... the the tribes of Israel, to walk, aground, walk across on dry ground across the River Jordan into the promised land, onto the other side. Somebody say the other side. We have to ask and trust God to bring us to the other side. What is that obstacle in your life that you are trying to break through in order to bring you to the other side? What is the thing that is holding you back from experiencing the power of the resurrection? 
What is that thing that is holding you back from launching out and becoming all that God has called you to be? Could it be that we have not yet grabbed hold of the hem of the garment of Jesus Christ and followed him all the way through the cross and through Silent Saturday and into Resurrection Sunday? Could it be that we have not allowed the power of the resurrection and everything that Jesus is and the power of the Holy Spirit to live in us, to transform us, to empower us, and to give us the life that we truly need in order to survive? We all have different obstacles. We all have different valleys. Darkness looks different to all of us. But God wants to bring each of us unto the other side. If I were to give today's message a title, I would give it this title. You're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong place. If we are stuck in doubt, we're in the wrong place. If we are stuck in hurt, we're in the wrong place. If we are stuck in confusion, we're in the wrong place. If we are stuck on material things, we're in the wrong place. But God wants to bring us out of that place and into the right place. Can I hear an amen? Well, today you're in the right place. Today, you're in the right place. Today, I'd like to offer my top 10 reasons why I believe the resurrection. Top 10 reasons why I believe in the resurrection, not just of the dead, which was a doctrine, a theology, a teaching, or a theory, or a concept in and of itself, but why I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Why believe in the resurrection of the Son of God? We know that Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. Amen? Read John chapter 11. You'll see Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. Jesus did it. God did it. He resurrected a dead man. The Sadducees, which was a sect of the Jewish leaders or Jewish officials, did not believe in any kind of resurrection. But the Pharisees did. Which is why in the Gospels, we don't hear much about what the Sadducees were trying to do to discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the Pharisees were the ones trying to undo the resurrection of Jesus because they didn't want everybody putting their eggs in that basket, the basket of Jesus. I hope you hide some eggs for your kids today too. It signifies the Passover and where they, the Jewish tradition is to hide the leaven the unleavened bread. Let the kids go around and and try and find it. So it's it's stuck with us in our Judeo-Christian faith and religion. Yeah, I said religion. Religion ain't bad. How many of us are learning that? Religion is not bad. It's relationship and religion, but it's religion that we practice. It's coming to church ritualistically, every week, worshiping God, paying our tithes. Amen? Jesus was religious. Jesus was pious. Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Passover every year. He celebrated many of the other great high holy days. So nothing wrong with religion. Just don't get stuck on religiosity. Amen? Don't get stuck on religiosity because Jesus also came to undo some of the religious practices of his day, demonstrating to us that it's more important to apprehend, to comprehend the spirit, the essence of who God is and why God sent his son to this earth, to this dark and dying people. It's very significant. Number one. If you're tracking along with me, you have your journal, you can follow along, you can write these down. 
or you can just simply watch this message all over again. And by the way, let's welcome Pastor Tony Gomez over here, who's on my right, your left, who is uh, doing an artistic rendering of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in his own form of worship. Pastor Tony Gomez is director of FCA in Santa Ana, Orange County, California. He's a graduate of the Latin American Bible Institute. Well, Pastor Isaac was the president and serving there at that great school from San Jose. He's a NCAA and state champ wrestler. Don't mess with Pastor Tony Gomez. And after the service, after the service, one lucky family is going to go home with that, that painting right there. Number one. The first reason is agreement. Number one, agreement. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts, and several of Paul's letters reference the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for the sake of time today, because I don't have hours upon hours to hold all of you up, with the hundreds of exhibits that I can put up on my, my virtual screen over here. I'm going to leave it at this. There are three elements that all four of the gospel accounts share. The three rudimentary elements, the most basic consistencies of all four gospels are going to include these things. Number one. Women, specifically Mary Magdalene, is mentioned in all four of the gospel, of count, gospel accounts. Number two, the angels. In every gospel account, the angels or angel are mentioned. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Even in Luke, although you may say, well, Luke doesn't say there were angels. It says that there were two men. Well, it actually does say angels. If you go over in chapter 24 a little further, you'll see in verse 23 it says, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. So it refers to angels later on in the chapter. And the third element, which are the three most basic consistencies or agreement in the four gospel accounts, Coach Bryant, Detective Brian is this, the empty tomb. They all mention una tumba vacía, an empty tomb, an empty garden tomb, which is where the rich were buried. A poor man's grave would have been a hole in the ground on the outskirts of town. But Jesus died and was buried in a rich man's tomb, which was the garden tomb, which many believe is just a few hundred paces away from Calvary on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And it wasn't just any tomb. We, on this side of Resurrection Sunday, somebody say on this side. You see, because none of us can ever be on that side looking that way, we were all born on this side of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the only thing that we can go to or deal with is anything that is on this side looking back and pointing to the details of what it is that we read. So the first point is the agreement of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, both referencing women, what else? What? Angels and the empty tomb. Somebody say the empty tomb. That's point number one. Point number two. Old Testament messianic prophetic fulfillment. What does that mean? It just means this. For all the young people, pay attention. That there were some old authors, some writers who wrote hundreds of years even up to a thousand years before the birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus, including the ascension, 
that wrote about the details of how things would come to be. And specifically, we're talking about the resurrection. So let's see what it says here in Psalm chapter 16. It says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Can I hear an amen? What it's speaking to right here, that the holy one would not see corruption, is because on the fourth day is when a body starts to decay or decompose. That's, a, that's forensic science for you. But on the third day, which was referenced in the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament, that Jesus would be raised from the dead on the third day in order that his body would not begin to experience decomposition. Are you following me, church? So we see here that David was speaking to that specific messianic prophecy about the Holy One not seeing corruption. So in other words, that Jesus would be raised from the dead before his body began to decompose for those who are following and thinking with me. Secondly, Psalm 22, verse 16. David, King David also prophesied, who wrote 1,000 years before his own son, Jesus, prophesied that Jesus' hands and feet would be pierced. And Jesus, in many of the gospel accounts, demonstrated by the holes in his hand and the holes in his feet and the holes in his side that he was pierced. Isaiah says that he was pierced for our what? Our iniquities or our transgressions. For our sins. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. So watch this, you guys. Because we are sinners, God took on sin through his son Jesus Christ. To forgive our sins, anybody that would put their trust in him would receive forgiveness of sin and his eternal life. Amen? And thirdly, Isaiah 53, that Jesus would be buried among the rich. According to Matthew chapter 27, verse 57, it says that he was buried in a rich man's tomb, which belonged to who? Anybody know? Joseph of Arimathea, who went with Nicodemus right, to those who were in charge of the burial, the mummification of Jesus, and they asked for Jesus' body after he died. They probably paid a good fee, a pretty penny for it. Said, can you transfer over his body unto us? So in other words, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus act and served as sort of morticians, and that they would take him then to the people that they knew and pay them to wrap Jesus' body in fine, expensive ointments and oils and mummify his body. Are you with me, church? After the mummification process, Jesus' body, let's just say Jesus weighed 175 to 180. You can go up to 200 if you want. It means that Jesus' body, after being fully wrapped, was somewhere, somewhere well over 300 pounds. You're going to need that fat later on in the message, over 300 pounds. That's a big dude. That's a, that's a heavy body. Have you ever tried carrying a limp 12 and a half year old who's about to go into puberty from the couch to his bed, who only weighs 110 pounds and his name is Judah? That boy is dense. I try to pick Judah up, but I, I'm, not a, I'm not an athlete anymore. And by the time I get up to the, the last step, my legs are like wobbling, and I just throw them in, baby, like, yeah, you're good from here, bro. Boomy, like, you ain't going to tuck them in, you ain't going to wrap them. Like, no, I carried that sucker up the steps. Some of you are like, you should have just left them on the couch. Why not shoot up, huh? But you ever tried carrying a limp body like that? It ain't no joke. Point number three. So we dealt with the old New Testament agreement. Now we're going to the Old Testament prophetic fulfillment. Fulfillment means that it has been uh, completed, that what was foretold has now become completed. According to the details, that gives us scientific 
textual criticism and evidence that the, the ancient texts that were speaking about the future Messiah are being fulfilled. That is pretty awesome. That is pretty amazing. In other words, when you become a Christian or when you start thinking about the things of God and God begins to resonate in your spirit, please don't check your, your, your brain in at the door. My dad didn't go to Harvard for nothing. I didn't go to, I didn't go to Fuller Seminary for nothing to learn the word of God, to study the word of God, to test the word of God, and to prove the word of God. I didn't, I didn't do all that study, because how many of you know that? Study, studying can make you tired and sick. Can I hear an amen? Too much study make you go crazy. But don't check your, 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 your brain in at the door. God wants us to use our brains. Number three is this. The credibility of the resurrection. The, the, the resurrection, the plausibility of the resurrection of Jesus is also based on the differences in the gospel accounts. The differences, pay attention right here. The differences in the, the gospel accounts. So on one hand, you can look at the similarities and the things that they agree about and that they share in common. But it's also equally important for us to also look at the differences that are in the gospel accounts. Why is it important to look at the differences? Let's check it out. Number one, they all have different sequence of events. Some say the women got there. I like what Matthew says. Matthews say that Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb early that Sunday morning, and watch this. As she arrived at the tomb, the guards were there, greeted her. Guess what happened next? An angel appeared before her and the guards. The Bible says that there was an earthquake. The Greek word is seismos. Everybody say seismos. I don't know what the, uh, I don't know what the Richter scale said, but the Bible says there was an earthquake. And the tombstone was rolled away in front of Mary Magdalene and the women that were there at the tomb. Matthews is the only gospel that says it that way. You're like, i never seen that. Go ahead. Check it out. Matthew chapter 28. She witnessed the angel move the stone. The other gospels don't mention that the women witnessed the moving of the stone. Which begs the question for me, how did Jesus get out the tomb? I'll let you mess with that one. Another thing, something that lends credibility to the plausibility of the resurrection of Jesus is that the number of angels at the tomb that are spoken about differ. Some say one, some say two. Some just say angels, but there's, there's a difference, and that's important also to understand that differences are significant. The differences are significant. I'm not going to go all the way there where I want to go yet, and y'all know where I'm going with this. The next point of this credibility of differences is when the tombstone was removed, I did, we already discussed that. It says that the guards fainted. Other versions don't even mention that the guards fainted. Next, there's a different number of women and different representation of men that went to the tomb to discover or to go and see what had happened there in the garden tomb. Some say the women went and found Peter and Peter came back. Other versions say that the women went and found Peter and the disciples. John's gospel, John's gospel mentions, because John is the beloved disciple, and he includes himself, his is the only gospel account, son, that mentions that John the beloved disciple, or the disciple that Jesus loved, 
was also there with Peter and went to the tomb to, to be an eyewitness of the empty tomb. Are you with me, church? All right, so those are the three. Number four, the fourth reason on my top ten list, and there are so many more, and you probably have more that you can add to this, but for the sake of, of today and time, we're going to stick with ten. Is that okay? The next point is this, that women were the first witnesses at the empty tomb. They were the first to see, and they were the first to say. The women were the first to see and the first to say. You're like, women are like, yeah. Ladies. That's right. But, but why is that so significant for us? It's important because of this. To, in our day and age, in our context, young people, sit up on your chair, watch me, pay attention, listen to this. In our context, there are, we all know that there are women lawyers, right? We all know that women can sit on the witness stand, right? We all know these things. We know that there are women judges, amen, justices. What, what is the name? Amy Barrett. What's her last name? Cone, is it Coney? Was one of the justices that was appointed to the Supreme Court. So we know that women in the 21st century are credible are brilliant, are bold, are just as smart as men, in some cases a whole lot smarter as is, as is in the case of my marriage to Boomi. She is way smarter than I am. <laughs> Y'all are like, why do you think I married her? We met at UCLA, you know the school where it's really hard to get in as opposed to the other school down the street. <clears throat> You actually have to have some brains to get into the blue and gold. Even though we lost in the final four last night, oh, my gosh, a heartbreaker. Uh, you Trojans, stay with me, Trojans. But check this out. Check this out. In the first century, Roman world, women were not credible witnesses in the court of law. Women could not testify. In the court of law, they were not credible. We've, we've come a long way in society and culture. Women used to not be able to vote in the United States of America until they were able to, to earn that right. Not even earn it. It should have been given to them a long time ago. But, but back in the 21st century, women couldn't even, they couldn't even be a witness in court, let alone be a credible person or witness to an event. But here in the Gospels, it says that the women were the first ones to get to the tomb first. Now, now, if somebody was trying to make an account that made sense for the first century church, and they really wanted to make sure to, to make it believable, if they wanted to work on things and doctor it up, they surely would not have mentioned the fact that women were the first at the tomb. They would have made it so that men were the ones to witness the empty tomb. They would have made it so that men were the ones to give the first account. They would have made it so that men were the first ones to come in contact with Jesus and, and they gra and grabbed onto his leg. No, but it was women. It was women that Jesus spoke to first when he came out of the tomb. I don't know if he walked through that, that wall, through, that, through those stones. I don't know where he, if, if he just broke all the laws of physics and just, just walked right on through, but guess what? The Bible says there was nobody there in the empty tomb. Amen. So if somebody was really trying to manipulate the situation for the purposes of belief in the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, they would not have included women as the first witnesses to the empty tomb or to meeting Jesus. But they were. Number five, multiple attestation. Multiple attestation. It's just a big fancy word for many and several people attested to the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. 
When you have multiple people or groups or entities that can attest to an event, a situation, or a circumstance, then you can establish a grounds from which you can then move on to your next point. Are you with me, folks? You tracking with me? The, all of this is very important, especially if we were trying to prove this case in the court of law or prove it intellectually to somebody who was looking through the scriptures or wanting to come to, to an understanding of who Jesus is. So there was more than one account. If there was only one account in the New Testament, only one book, only one author that wrote about the resurrection of Jesus, wouldn't it have been harder for you and me and everybody else to actually believe that it had taken place? But the fact that there were multiple attestations and that many of the attestations, guess what, had different different uh, specifics, different details, different accounts, different perspectives about the event adds validity and credibility to the resurrection of Jesus. Point number six. Different points of view, perspective, or accounts. I've kind of touched on it and highlighted it in a certain way, but we're going to go on to the other side of this. Watch this. Different points of view, perspective, or accounts. This lends integrity to the plausibility of the whole thing. It means that there were no people behind closed doors scheming or trying to get the story straight. Okay, now let's go, let's go over it again. What are you going to say? Okay, what are you going to say, Mary? Magdalene, oh, what are you going to say, say, Mary, mother of James? Oh, uh, Salome, what are you going to say? Joanna, what, what are you going to say now? Let's make sure we get all these stories straight. Peter, hey, make sure you say it like this, and, and make sure you, you, you add all of the sequence of events in the same order. Hey, we can't have any holes in this story. Otherwise, you know, guess what? People are, people are going to, you know, question what was going on. Uh, we've all been there. We've all been there. I remember playing in the backyard with the, with the guys. Hey, man, don't, don't, tell, don't tell mom and dad who broke the, broke the window, man. Just, you know, say it was a bird that just flew right through the glass. All right, we all good? It was a bird, right? No, it was a baseball. It was a baseball that broke the glass. So guess what? They did not scheme. They were not in cahoots. There was no manipulation of the facts. Of the details because of oral tradition and the way people relied on storytelling guess what they were a lot sharper than us when it came to narr uh, narrative when it came to telling stories or sequences or events they were a lot sharper than us because we have so many things that help us with our memory how many of you know what I'm talking about Man, we got phones now. We can take pictures of things. We don't have to type it anymore. Just take the picture and send the receipt. There's your invoice. We got lots of things that help us recall. Back then, they relied on pure memory. Does that make sense? Praise God. It's like this. How many of you, raise your hand if you ever witnessed a car accident or you ever been in an accident? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Y'all know what I'm talking about because you spent hours on the phone with the insurance companies. Or you sat, at, you sat on the curb shaking up because of what you just saw or witnessed, offered some orange juice so you can make it through and give your account of what just happened. Who ran the red light? Who was on their phone texting? What took place? Whose fault was it? Whose fault wasn't it? The doctors on Good Friday morning were going door to door, and my neighbor was like, did you see what happened? Was there anybody awake? What did you hear? Trying to get the, the details of what took place on my corner in Long Beach. Very sad case. But guess what? If you had four people on four corners of an intersection, and they witnessed that car accident, they would all have a different story to tell. They would all give a different sequence of events to tell 
about the car accident, they probably even say it was his fault, and somebody else would say, no, it was her fault. Which is all good, fine, and dandy. They don't need to agree on whose fault it was or whose fault it wasn't. All they need to agree upon is what? There was an accident in the middle of the street. There's one thing that they all agree on. That women went to the tomb, that angels appeared to them, and that the tomb was empty. There was nobody home. They were looking in the wrong places. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why do many of us insist on living a life in the darkness? Why do many of us insist on living a life outside of Christ? Why do many of us, when we do believe, insist on not walking with God and living life in the fullness of Jesus? It's because we haven't come to the other side to look back and see all that God has brought us through, brought us from, brought us out of. But maybe today is that day where God brings us to the other side of recollection. Point number seven. This is one of my favorites. I heard my pops preach this when I was a teenager before I went to the University of Florida. One of his favorite points to bring out. By the way, pops is preaching at the Spanish service right after this if you want to stick around. Praise God. The tomb was orderly. Elisha, make your bed. Judah, make your bed. The tomb was orderly. Several of the gospel accounts say that Jesus' linen that he was wrapped in was laid out right there where Jesus had been lying down. John chapter 20, verse 7 says that his sudarium, the head wrap, which was wrapped separate from the mummification and the body wrap, was folded neatly and laid down right there on the stone where Jesus had been laid. Are you guys with me? Are you tracking with me? You're like, what does that mean? What does that have to do with this resurrection or my belief in the resurrection? Man, have, have any thieves ever broken into your house, burglarized your house? Have any thieves ever just violated you, violated your house, violated your sanctuary, broken into your car? Have they ever cleaned up after themselves? Never in my life have I, have I ever experienced a burglarization where it was clean. I'm talking, chones swinging from the fan. I mean, every dumping out drawer because they're just trying to get in, get out, look for gold, look for money, look for coins, look for guns. Catalytic converters. They just break in and break out and they out. So if somebody had come, watch this, here's the point. If somebody had come to steal the body of Jesus and to pull an April Fool's prank on the whole world, do you think they would have neatly taken their time, wrapped up Jesus' linen, wrapped up his sudarium, his head rack, and laid it there right there in the tomb for everybody to come and take perfect Forensic science pictures of, you know what I'm saying, CSI, Jerusalem. No. Matthew chapter 27 shows that the chief priests, Pharisees, other teachers of the law, and other religious leaders were paying attention to what Jesus was saying about his resurrection from the dead, the sign of Jonah. That he was, swelled, he was swallowed by a whale and spit out on the third day. 
That's another sign in the Old Testament, a symbolic sign of the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. Guess what? It says that to prevent the disciples or anybody else from coming in to try and steal the body of Jesus, we're going to hire some porters. We're going to hire some security guards. Guess what? Pilate was the one who spent the money to put extra security guards at the tomb. And to add on to that, to add evidence and credibility to the extra security guards and the extra money that they spent to guard the tomb from theft or burglarization is this. They were on the lookout on which day? Go ahead. Which day? Say it again. Say it again. The third day. Now, if you're on a stakeout and they say, you know, right around 12 p.m., that's when things, this thing's going to go down. You're going to be on the lookout at 12 p.m. You're going to be ready. The guard's going to be right there. Hand on the sword. Hand on the trigger. Looking for anybody. Go ahead, cross me, fool. Go ahead, try to get by, fool. But guess what? When that angel appeared and that earthquake shook the ground, homeboys just knocked out. The guards were right there. They just went like, they just went like this. Look, they just went to sleep like. <laughs> they were out cold. The Bible says it was like they fainted. They couldn't believe. Boom. General anesthesia. Before it's time. So the tomb was left orderly, according to the Gospel of John. Which is our seventh point today. And knowing that even if the disciples had tried to steal the 300 plus pound body of Jesus, they would not have been able to do it without commotion. The guards would have really had something to say, or they would have been dead, probably by Peter. Remember when Peter sliced the ear off the guard when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden? You remember that one? Je Peter would have been the one to be like, watch out, fool, I'm coming to get Jesus, man, watch out. We don't know what we're going to do with this body after we carry, all 10 of us carry his 300-pound body. We don't know what we're going to do his, with his, his soon-to-decay, soon-to-decompose body, but we just want to steal his body. That doesn't make sense, does it? That don't make sense. So why would the disciples want to steal the body of Jesus to somehow concoct a lie or to fulfill the Messianic Old Testament prophecies about Jesus and about his resurrection physically and bodily in order to somehow prove something to the world or the known world at the time? It don't make sense. But the tomb was left orderly. And I believe Jesus walked right on through the stone wall. Praise the Lord. Amen. Number eight. Number eight. Number eight. Somebody say number eight. I love this. I have never heard this in a message. I've never heard this in supporting evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. I haven't. Maybe you have. Praise the Lord. But watch this. Not one of the four gospel accounts, pay attention, watch this. Not one of the four ever tries to, to describe with any kind of details how Jesus resurrected from the dead. Think about that for a moment. None of the four try to describe how Jesus resurrected or how God resurrected Jesus from the dead. 
The only things that we are discussing, the only things we have been able to discuss for 2,000 years is the post-resurrection circumstances, sequence of events after Jesus resurrected from the dead. Now you're like, okay, yeah, so? Well, we don't have any tryhards. That means that none of the four gospel accounts tried to make up a story of what Jesus did in the tomb when he was waking up. Well, did he take the wrap off of his head first? Did he just slip out of the, the, the linen cloths? Did he, did he sit up? Did God do it? What happened? Nobody, nobody in the gospel accounts ever tried to say how it happened or how he did it or how it took place. Are you with me, y'all? So for me, by evidence of deduction, by us being able to see that there is an absence, there is an absence of anybody trying to meddle with that aspect or element of the resurrection is supremely profound for me. It's very important to me. How many of us ever got rumor or gossip about something happened? We, people start adding details. So what I heard was, I, well, I was listening on the CB. See, because I have, I have a radio interference that gets connected to all the cop cars because I'm former military. And guess is what? Guess what? This is what happened. Oh, yeah, and, and, and this happened and that happened. And guess what? Man, none of that happened. So how did it even get to that point? That's not the case here. It's not the case here. Nobody meddled. Nobody tries to explain. Nobody tries to come up with an explanation with the reason or with the way in which Jesus resurrected from the, from the grave. It simply says the grave was empty. Either he walked out of that grave right through the walls or the, the, the stone was rolled first and then he walked out before anybody was there. I don't know. You don't know. We don't know. Nobody knows except him and, him and Father God. Are y'all with me? Praise God. Now we got forensic science that would be able to peek through and parse through all the details to see if somebody was fibbing or telling a lie, right? I'm sure they had their ways back then too. They probably had the best money could buy to come in and try and figure out what was happening. That's why Pilate and the chief priests, after Jesus' body was resurrected from the dead, they paid the soldiers that were there at the tomb. Read John chapter 20, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 27. It says that they paid the soldiers off and paid them to go and tell a story that the disciples of Jesus carried his body off. Now, does that make sense? Does that make sense? It doesn't. You know why? They wouldn't be able to dispose of his body. There would be no place that they would be able to hide the body of Jesus, even if they wanted to. Number nine. Luke chapter 24, verse 41. Jesus was hungry. Anybody ever see a dead man eat? Anybody ever see a ghost eat? Real people eat. People with real appetite, people that have been, been dead in the grave for three days eat. People eat. Teenagers eat a lot. They eat you out of house and home. In Luke chapter 24, verse 41, Jesus, after a long walk down the road to Emmaus with two of his disciples who didn't even know who he was for a long haul of that, that road, that journey, Jesus finally looked over at them and says, hey, by the way, man, you got anything to eat? I am famished. That's pretty refreshing to me because remember in the book of John chapter 4 when Jesus was at the well? They're like, hey, Jesus, you want, you want us to pick you up some tacos, bro? Some tacos from Great, uh, great Mexican Grill? Oh, no, nah, I'm good. I have food ye know not of. Not in this case. Jesus was the one that says, hey, Bring me some, one fish and one shrimp taco. 
Because God said kill and eat. Amen. All is good. No, I'm kidding. He probably didn't eat shrimp, but you know. And number 10. Number 10. Our last point. Because he said so. Because Jesus said so. Jesus said he would, and he did. Jesus made a promise, and he kept it, just like a good father, just like a good mother, just like a man or a woman, a young person who has honor. When they give their word, they what? They keep it. Jesus said that he would be raised from the dead on the third day. And we've just talked about all the reasons why we can believe that he did. Now, there have been a lot of people that have been self-proclaimed messiahs, self-proclaimed gods, other people who have deified people, made other people into gods. But the, la but the last time any martyr was ever killed for a worthy cause, they stayed dead. Muhammad died. And his bones are bleaching somewhere in Middle Earth. Many have died for good causes. If it wasn't for the resurrection, the death of Jesus on a cross would be worthless. If it wasn't for the resurrection and the power of the empty tomb, Jesus' death on Calvary would be the same as any criminal's death, would be the same as any martyr's death. It would not have had any efficacy. What is efficacy? It means that it does what it was designed to do. It means that it, it worked. Somebody say it worked. The only reason the cross works is because of the resurrection. The only reason why your sins and my sins can be forgiven is because Jesus walked out of the tomb. Because Jesus walked out of the dead people. And because, and because he did, you and I can face tomorrow because he lives. Because we serve a risen Savior. Because we serve a living God. Because we serve the Son of God who is seated, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. You and I can face tomorrow. Our sins are forgiven. Our past sin, our current sin, our future sin has already been nailed to the cross. Once and for all. Because he lives.